thank you guys so much for showing up. The real reason you're here is to learn about something that, I mean, you know, for me, when I was first learning about Missouri streams and, and creeks as a kid, like crawdads were what it was all about. Um, and there was, I mean, I'm not real proud of it and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone, but you know, we cooked up some crawdads back in the day and thought we were high tech chefs down there on the black river. Um, when Bob gets into this, he can tell us if that's really a good idea or not. Um, but I think that at this point we kind of can use all the crawdads doing their job in the streams that we can. Right. So, um, Stoked to learn more about the details and, and Bob DiStefano from Missouri Department of Conservation um, is a resource scientist there um, and has been for a bunch of years. And, you know, you may see some people in here that have interesting T-shirts like Dave here, the Craw Wars shirt. So hopefully Bob will explain what that's all about as well. Um, but come on up, Bob, and. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. And thank Missouri River Relief for having me out. Um, this is likely my last professional presentation before I quit working in about two months. So see if I can do a decent job here. I'm going to get right into it because I've got about an hour's worth of material. So. You can read the title, what good are they and what are we doing for them? And I'm gonna, like I said, get right into it. This is tonight's agenda. I'm gonna start you off with a little lesson about crayfish biology and ecology. And uh, then I'm gonna move into the, their importance to our waterways, both in our country and our state, looking at their importance to biodiversity as well as their ecological importance. And then I'll move into talking about the state of conservation for crayfishes in our country and in our state. Talk a little bit about threats to them and conservation efforts specifically here in Missouri. So we're gonna start out pretty simple. What's in a name? And uh, all of these names listed here are colloquialisms for the same animal. We're talking about crayfish, their crustaceans, much like lobsters, crabs, and shrimp. I don't want to bore you with too much anatomy, but there's a couple cool things about crayfish. They have 10 legs, five pairs of legs, but the foremost set are modified, I think probably everyone in here knows, modified into what we call pinchers or claws. And those are specifically used for feeding, defense, and mating. And I'll talk a little bit about the mating part of it later on. It might get a little steamy in here. <laughs> um, they have a set of antennae, these longer ones on the outside, and then antennules on the inside. They do have eyes and they can see, but they don't see really well. So when they move through the water column, those antennae and antennules are just loaded with chemoreceptors. So they literally taste and feel their environment as they move through it. I think everyone here probably knows about the exoskeleton or the shell. Um, and it's great because everything out there in the world wants to eat a crayfish. So they've got a, a suit of armor. The only problem is in order to grow, they're contained within that. So when it's time to grow, they have to shed that or molt that exoskeleton. And this is probably the most sensitive time in their life cycle. They have to find a quiet place under a rock, whatever, lose that shell, crawl out of it, and then they have to wait a few days until the new shell hardens. The last thing I want to talk about with regard to the anatomy is this tail fan for, uh, I won't get into the scientific terms, but what's cool about that, I, most people have probably seen crayfish walking through a pond or a stream, but if you ever scare one, they have the ability uh, to just jet away from you using flips of that tail fan, uh, kind of like a jet propulsion. And it what allows them, it's what allows them to escape from a lot of predators. 
you'll hear this many times tonight, but everything out there in the world wants to eat crayfish, not just Steve. Uh, all right, a little bit about the life cycle. I'd be a little disingenuous if I stood up here and told you I was going to tell you the life cycle of the crayfish. We have about 40 species or more in Missouri, and every single one of those species has little differences in their life cycle. So I am going to be disingenuous, and I'm going to tell you about one generalized life cycle that works for a lot of our species. Generally speaking, in the autumn, for most of our Missouri species, that's when they breed. And uh, the males will generally walk around on the stream bottom, the lake bottom, looking for females. They don't see real well. Oftentimes, they'll run into another male, and they'll try to mate with them. And after a while, they'll figure out this is going nowhere. Um, the male's claws or chelae are heavier and stronger than the females. So when they do find a female, they'll quickly subdue her, flip her on her back. It's a pretty violent uh, process. Flip her on her back and just go to it. Um, and uh, it can take up to seven or eight hours. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I won't touch that one. Uh, anyway, the female will store the sperm in her, it's called annulus ventralis right here. I don't know if you can see that between the last two legs. And she'll store that through the winter and come late winter, early spring, she'll get ready to extrude these eggs from the same vent. And as she does, those eggs will pass over that stored sperm and they'll be fertilized at that point. The eggs are extruded through that pore and she manipulates them and glues them with a substance that she produces, a glue she produces and glues them to the underside of her abdomen right here in a cluster. And um, you're all probably looking at that saying, that looks like a bunch of berries, right? Well, even scientists think that. And when a female is in that condition, she is said to be in berry or buried. I said this was a general life cycle for covering a lot of species. So the species we have in Missouri, they may carry anywhere from about 50 to 500 eggs under there. So the female will find a quiet place to hide away from predators while she's carrying those eggs for two, three, maybe up to four weeks. And at that point, they'll hatch. And the, uh, the larvae will come out, will hatch. And there's three larval stages pictured here, one, two, and three. They have to molt from one into the other. Each one lasts a few days. The last one looking more progressively like a, an adult crayfish. And that whole process takes about two weeks. And again, it's in the spring. And the, the first two stages are actually physically attached to the underside of that female with an abyssal thread-like uh, substance. But that third stage is pretty much free to roam about. And what they'll do is they'll take little forays off of their mother, wander around on the stream or lake floor until they sense danger or she communicates to them there's danger, and they'll scramble back to her, to the underside of her, as we see in this photo. So anyway, all that lasts about two weeks, and here in Missouri in late spring or very early summer, they'll just one day just wander off from her and never come back. And I, at that point, they're about a third of an inch in length. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. He asked if they have one brood per year. And it depends on the year. Some will even mate their first year of life. Uh, but the bulk of them won't mate until their second year. 
And again, it varies from species to species because some of our species only live for two to three years. So they got to get it done pretty soon. Which leads me into the longevity. Um, so there's two to five years for most Missouri species, but it's really difficult to age crayfish. They don't have a hard bony structure like a fish that we can age. Fish, we use scales or bones and they lay down rings like trees. Crayfish don't really have that hard part, a bone, because they don't have bones. And I actually participated in a pilot study being done out of Oklahoma a few years ago where they're developing some modern techniques for aging crayfish. And we sent some specimens over. And I'm going to guess that in a few years, those techniques are going to become the way to go. And we're going to find out that some of our Missouri species are living up to about seven, eight years. The cave species are different. And I'm going to mention cave crayfish a couple times tonight. And these are unique. They live in a cave their entire lives. They're blind. They don't have eyes. Their color's bleached out. They're white. They live in this very stable environment that maintains the same temperature year round. There's very little food, but they really don't have to move around a whole lot either. either. So <clears throat> there have been some cave crayfish kept in captivity down in Florida and Alabama that people have had in aquaria for three decades. So, which is incredible for an invertebrate, if you think about it. You can't think of many invertebrates that will live that long. These cave crayfish are an organism unto themselves, and I love them. I'm working on them right now. Okay, uh, adults of most Missouri species will tap out at about anywhere from one inch to seven inches in length as adults. Uh, the the largest species we have, the long pictured crayfish from southwest Missouri, is probably either the third or fourth largest crayfish in the country. Um, and contrast that with the largest crayfish in the world. Pictured here, I've been um, lucky enough to go to Tasmania where it lives and work on this thing for a couple days each time, uh, twice. These are the largest in the world. And They've been recorded as big as 31 inches in length and 11 pounds. Yeah. And they were almost fished into extinction, as you can imagine. Highly sought after. All right, let's talk about crayfish habitats. Basically, in Missouri, anywhere you find water except your bathtub, you could probably find crayfish. They live in streams, lakes and ponds, wetlands, and we even have, I already told you about the caves. We have uh, what we call true burrowing crayfish that live in burrows that they excavate down in the soil up in our river and stream floodplains. Okay, now this structure here is what we call a crayfish chimney. And this is made of the little mud balls that the crayfish creates when it digs the mud. It's digging the burrow and it's moving that mud or that dirt out of the burrow and it piles it out at the hole at the top of the burrow and it ends up being like a chimney and that hole will go all the way down through the top and that actually has functions like regulating airflow but on a on a healthy floodplain you'll see these all over the place and the crayfish will live down in that burrow sometimes seven eight feet deep these burrows will have branches with rooms down below the water line. So they tunnel down through the soil till they find water, find a little pocket there, and they'll spend most of the year in there coming out for maybe a month just to feed heavily and then breed. As it says up there, habitat use is mostly species specific. So for example, in Missouri, we have some species that will only live in streams. Others will live in like lakes, ponds, sloughs, etc. Some in the caves, as I mentioned, some of these true burrowers. But even within a stream, sometimes these crayfish will partition habitats by species. We'll have some that just you'll find in fast water, 
Some are slow water species specialists, others are generalists, and you'll find them throughout a stream. The one thing that's true of all crayfish is that shelter is critical. Again, everything out there wants to eat them, so they're always looking for a rock or a down tree, a branch, or an aquatic vegetation patch is uh, artfully presented in this piece here. Um, they're looking for anywhere to hide from predators. All right, let's talk about crayfish diversity. A little side note here. Uh, when, when I was growing up, I had a brother that was a year younger than me. And at one point, he had aquariums and had tropical fish. And I know a lot of people have tropical fish. Probably several of you did. But I just want to make a plug here and tell you, uh, I know people have tropical fish because they love the colors and the shapes and sizes and all that. But I think some of our crayfish rival the colors of tropical fish. Every single one of these crayfish in these photos here is a native Missouri species. I want you to look at that co the color and the diversity there. Most of you probably never realized what we have here. Uh, just as a side note, this is that blind white cave crayfish that I mentioned before. All right, a little school lesson here. I don't, I don't want to talk down to anyone, but I'm um, going to give you just a few technical terms here. First of all, uh, most of you probably know what biodiversity is, but if you don't, we scientists talk about it a lot. It's the degree of variation of life such as numbers and kinds of species, genetic types, or even ecosystems. And we scientists say that biodiversity is crucial to life on our planet. Ecosystems with greater biodiversity equal more, sta they're more stable, they provide more sustainable products and services to people in our planet. Okay, so scientists put a very high value on biodiversity. You have more biodiversity, you have healthier, stable, more natural, productive systems. We know that Americans value biodiversity. A, a 2014 Harris poll of over 2,000 U.S. adults, 90% of those people polled said, agreed to the statement that biodiversity is important to the well-being of humans. 50% of those people ranked it as very important, and 91% believed that it's important to Earth's well-being. So that came kind, of as a, came as kind of a surprise to me when I read those data, but it's encouraging. Here in Missouri, we see some similar results. Our agency years ago contracted the Gallup organization to run a poll of Missouri citizens, and Missouri citizens ranked protecting biodiversity as second only to protecting endangered fish and wildlife in all pro-environment activities that our agency should be conducting. So consequently, our 2003 strategic plan featured goal number one as preserving and restoring the state's biodiversity. So let's talk a little bit about diversity of crayfish. You can read the numbers there. We have close to 700 species in the world, almost 450 in North America, about 400 in the United States, and the majority of those are east of the Rocky Mountains, where we have a lot more water, per se. As an aside, this is a poster uh, that the American Fisheries Society put out, uh, excuse me, the Fish and Wildlife Service, in conjunction with Virginia Tech University, go Hokies. Um, and you just take a glance at this, and you can see all the color on here. These are all uh, North American species of crayfish. In Missouri, we currently have 40 species, maybe more, depending on the when the taxonomy gets worked out. When I started in this position 37 years ago, we only knew of about 20 seven species in Missouri. So it's been pretty cool to see that list grow. We have 10% of the crayfish species in the United States occur here in Missouri. Eight of those, eight of our Missouri species occur nowhere else in the world but in our state. 
17 others just barely leak over our borders into Kansas, Arkansas, Oklahoma. Just to kind of wind this part of it up, I'll just show you a little more on some of our diversity here. This is a pro bear species from the Boot Heel area. Uh, it's not the greatest photograph, but I think you can see it's a really pretty color of blue. This is a Cajun dwarf crayfish from, again, from the boot heel area. This thing grows to maybe an inch and a half in length. It's got these tan speckles and then dark tan stripes up and down it. The painted devil crayfish. So there are some people that try to argue this is red, white, and blue. Uh, and I guess you can see that, but it's beautiful. Uh, it's, it's also from the boot heel area. The cold water crayfish, I've done a lot of work on this species. This thing lives nowhere else in the world but in the 11 Point River in Missouri. And the freckled crayfish, one of my favorites, and we've done a lot of work on this, lives nowhere else in the world but the Merrimack River system of Missouri. And there's one of our cave species. We have three known cave species in Missouri and possibly a fourth. Um, and they all kind of look like this. A couple of them are fairly common. And we've got one in the state that right now we think might be the rarest crayfish in North America. And we're doing a lot of work on it. We're a little concerned about it. It lives in one pool of water a little bit bigger than this room in one cave in the world. And that's in Southern Missouri. And fortunately, it's one of on one of our conservation areas. And we have that cave gated off. And um, But unfortunately, the source of the water in that cave is not groundwater. It's surface runoff. And so we're a little concerned with climate change and the the rains being not so dependable anymore. Um, so we're scrambling really hard right now to try to get as much data as we can on this species and see what we can do to conserve it for the future. Here's a little contrast of our largest and smallest Missouri species. These are both full grown adults. That's the long pinchered crayfish on the left from Southwest Missouri. As I said, that grows to about seven inches. This is the Neosho midget crayfish, go figure. Uh, that's from also from Southwest Missouri. And that maxes out at about an inch. We have one more species. I, I gotta be honest while I'm up here. I can't just hide the bad stuff. We do have one species in the state we're not very proud of. And if you're out there kicking around in the streams or lakes or whatever, I hope you never run into this thing. It's not really a, a nice situation when you do. Uh, we just call this the troubled crayfish. <laughs> okay. A little review before I move on to something else. Again, biodiversity, numbers and kinds of species. Just remember biodiverse ecosystems are healthier, more productive, including goods and services to humans and the planet. And when you've got a biodiverse system, it's more stable and resilient to environmental disturbance. And most importantly here, right, crayfish contribute greatly to biodiversity in the U.S. and Missouri. That sort of ties it together. Now we're going to move on to the ecological role. So I think most of you have probably heard about food webs or food chains or whatever. Um, quick little primer on those. In science, we refer to it as the trophic web because we like to make things a little more difficult. But it's a description of what eats what in natural communities. Where the, and, and in natural communities and, and in science, when we talk about food, we're talking about energy and nutrients. So it's where the energy that powers ecosystems is derived, where it comes from and where it goes to, where it's used. And that transfer of energy sources from one part of a food web to another is critical to ecosystem function. So when we, when we scientists study 
an organism's ecological importance, we're always tracking the, their food webs and examining their role in food webs. Myself and a colleague of mine down at University of Arkansas who also works on crayfish, we kind of came up with this years ago, a simplistic statement about crayfish ecology. And it's basically crayfish eat everything and everything eats crayfish. So I'm going to take the first half of that equation now. We've done some studies here in Missouri, and there's been a few done elsewhere, looking at what crayfish eat and in what quantity. And as I go through this, I want you to think about other animals out there. And, to, and I challenge you to come up with any other animal that eats on all these trophic levels. Crayfish eat a lot of dead and decaying plants, leaves and woody debris that falls in the stream. So in the fall, when the leaves come off the trees and they, you see them clogging up the streams, go back to that stream in June, most of those leaves are gone. Where do they go? A lot of that leaf material is eat, broken down and eaten by crayfish and insects in those streams. And that is the, a big part of the basis of the food chain. Okay? So... 40 to 52% in some of these studies, including ours, of crayfish diet was that material. It can sustain them through the tough months. They eat living animals, insects, snails, mussels, worms, fish. It could make up anywhere from 20 to 50% of their diet. They eat living vascular plants and algae, 9 to 18% of their diet. And then they have this really cool method of feeding called filter feeding. They suck water in through their gills constantly. It's how they breathe. They also have these screens in their gills that screen out fine microscopic uh, particles, microbes, microscopic organisms, and crayfish can actually sustain themselves on this material when it's tough to find food elsewhere. So they can always get a meal eating from all these different trophic levels. And again, there's not too many animals that can do that. The gist of all this is crayfish is not going to go hungry. And because they're not going to go hungry, there's going to be this nice package of flesh that can transfer energy from many sources where they derive their energy up the food web. <clears throat> so here's the other half of the equation. Everything eats crayfish. I'm currently working on a, a new paper with a scientist uh, down in Mississippi. She works for the Forest Service, and she started this project and was gracious enough to let me in. We're just going to write a simple paper on what eats crayfish. And so we're scouring the scientific literature. We're only going to include organisms that are cited in peer-reviewed scientific literature. We're already over 325 organisms. And that's just in this country. Mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, and invertebrates in and around U.S. waterways. And remember, we're not just talking about aquatic predators. You just look at that list. There are things up in the trees that eat crayfish, things up on the ground that eat crayfish. They come down to the stream. There's probably a few people in here who fish. If you fish, um, years ago, we did a big study where I basically shoved a plastic tube down the throat of 10,000 fish over a couple year period and made them puke up into these plastic tubes. And then we took all this material back to the lab and studied what they ate. And mostly what we were looking at were the most popular sport fish in the southern half of Missouri, smallmouth bass and rock bass or goggle eye, and then some largemouth bass. We found Two-thirds of the diet of smallmouth bass, which is the most popular sport fish in southern Missouri, two-thirds of their diet is crayfish. Three-quarters of the diet of these goggle eye or rock bass, crayfish. Largemouth bass, three-quarters of their diet in adults. This was done in a few streams, um, not lakes. So I, I, that's a qualifier. We also found catfishes, brown trout, and many of the sunfishes eating small crayfish. We also know some wildlife species are almost totally dependent on crayfish. 
otters and hellbenders up to 90% of their diets. So crayfish are fueling uh, these organisms, lots of them. But they're good for a lot more than that. They're real big nutrient cyclers. They're the largest decomposers of dead plant materials, such as leaves and woody debris in our Missouri streams. They grind these or organic materials up into minute particles that can become their food and then food for other smaller invertebrates out on the stream bottom. And this in turn recycles nutrients throughout the food web. So in this way, they provide a service to their community, if you will. They're ecosystem engineers. Their movement, feeding and digging on stream, stream bottoms will resuspend deposited silt that can be then carried downstream, which improves habitat for other animals. They excavate burrows, many burrows, between and under rocks in streams and lakes, and create shelter for many insects and small fishes. So crayfish don't stay in one place all their life. They'll move around, and, and now that we've done some work with some of the University of Missouri scientists we've been partnering with for decades, we're finding there are crayfish movements throughout the year, and they'll go pretty far. And But everywhere they go, they'll dig burrows. And when they abandon these burrows, other creatures are moving in. And so, again, they're providing services for other members of their community. Back to these guys that live out on the floodplain. These will be branched tunnels under the ground when you look down there, going seven, eight, nine feet deep. And there'll be many branches and tunnel, uh, excuse me, chambers. And uh, not only, will, usually just one crayfish will big, dig that burrow, but there will be other organisms living in there, reptiles, amphibians, insects, the endangered, federally endangered Heinz emerald dragonfly, a uh, big part of its life cycle occurs in crayfish burrows. I love this slide. Um, this is a river floodplain, and I want you to look in the foreground, everything in front of this water body, probably an acre, acre and a half. Everywhere you see a red X, there's one of those crayfish chimneys under the, for the burrows. You count them, there's 62 of them, and I told you how much space underneath there's taken up with their burrows. Scientists actually went in and uh, estimated 7 to 12 miles of tunnels per acre. Can you imagine that? 7 to 12 miles in one acre. There's so much going on under the surface. So not only does that provide shelter for all those organisms I talked about in the previous slide, but they found that it aerates, moisten, and improves floodplain soils and enhances plant growth for river floodplain plants. So again, this is just another way crayfish are doing a service for the community and the ecosystem in which they live. I love this slide. Um, this is a very simplistic view of a food web, but everything here to the left where these arrows are pointing to this crayfish, this crayfish eats all those things, or it eats the organisms that eats them, or it eats both of them. And then the crayfish, again, I mentioned this earlier, fecal pellets drop out to the stream or the lake bottom, fed on by organisms like chironomids that eventually circle back. Everything ends up coming back to this nice, beautiful package of flesh, high energy flesh, that's then fed upon by, what did I say, 350 plus organisms. So I guess one way you can look at this is it's kind of like a bottleneck or whatever, if you will. Um, that sounds kind of negative, but it's uh, scientists have now started talking about crayfish as being keystone organisms, or more appropriately, based on the literature I've read, they'd be called ecological dominance in Missouri basically indicating that their role in ecosystems is greater than even their abundance or their numbers suggest. Okay, quick review. 
if you leave here tonight and you can only remember one thing, let's say it together now. Crayfish eat everything and everything eats crayfish. Okay, omnivorous feeding transfers energy up the food web to, we now know over 325 species, stimulates nutrient cycling and productivity of our aquatic ecosystems and creates habitat for many other animals. And now we'll move on. Crayfish conservation in our country. Historically, they were neglected, like a lot of things, compared to other animal groups. There's not a lot of flash. They don't have fur. Uh, before 1996, there were very few efforts from state or federal agencies on crayfish research, conservation, or management. There was only one state in the country that had conducted a comprehensive survey to even bother to learn what species were present and where they were. And you should all be proud because that was Missouri, okay? And it was my predecessor who did that. After 1996, things slowly changed. So my predecessor, he didn't really do the same job I did, and we overlapped a little, and he was always just like a father figure to me in some ways. Dr. Bill Flieger, who lives down in Ashland and unfortunately just passed away in the last year and a half, but he was hired here to do to study all the fishes of Missouri and he wrote a beautiful book on those. But he was smart enough and thought far enough ahead that when he was out sampling fish statewide, he would also collect crayfish. He knew nothing about them at the time, but he learned and he learned really well and eventually published this book that showed at the time about 32 species and their general ranges in the state. And this was the first book like this in the country, and it became a template for books in, that are now coming out in other states. So Missouri was first in something. In the past 25 years, other states have started surveying their crayfish fauna. Some have hired biologists like me. Uh, several have, in fact. And the biologists now all get together for meetings, and we can bitch and come up with solutions to things and pool our resources and things are really starting to take off and like I said I'm going to be out of this game in about two or three months and it's kind of a shame because I'm really starting to see a lot of young crayfish biologists now and a lot of collaborations and it's an exciting time for nerds like me. <laughs> um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is also interested in crayfish conservation now work closely with the state and university biologists particularly to assess probable threatened and endangered species. There are only six federally listed crayfish in our country now. Two of them are right here in Missouri, and that just happened within the past year. Unfortunately, the result of increased attention to this organism is that we are identifying many threats to them, to their populations, and we're documenting declines and imperilment of species. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the threats to crayfish. This is a graphic from a study done by the Nature Conservancy a few years ago. And basically every living thing in uh, the country is on this. They're kind of lumped together in some cases. But yeah, we do have plants, in case you're wondering, right here in the middle. Um, We've probably got a fair number of people who like to do birding here. So let's look down here at the bottom, birds. This is basically a graph of imperilment, four degrees, presumed extinct, critically imperiled, imperiled and vulnerable. Look at birds, uh, very popular with people. Uh, some of you may help with Christmas bird counts. So you're contributing to the database on birds. And there's a lot of people studying birds, but really, these are the, this is the least imperiled group of organisms we have in our country. Only 14% are even listed as some degree of imperilment. Contrast that with freshwater mussels up at the top. 70% of our freshwater mussel species have some type of conservation listing. It's why we have two, two actually two biologists at Missouri Department of Conservation working full time on freshwater mussels. You notice, we'll get. you knew I'd wind around to crayfish. 
The second bar down, crayfish, 51% of crayfish, according to this Nature Conservancy study, 51% of crayfish in our country face some type of imperilment. Okay, so this is Nature Conservancy. A separate study, uh, and this was a little older, 1996, done by the American Fisheries Society, which is my professional organization. And they looked at the US and Canada, and what they found was about 18% of crayfish were endangered, 14% threatened, 15% of special concern, and 52% or roughly half were considered stable. You flip that 52% around and that means 48% or basically half face some degree of imperilment. So these two separate organizations, one is a non-governmental agency or organization, one is a group of scientists. They came up with very similar data using different sources. Basically half of our crayfish in this country face some degree of imperilment. So why is that? I'm gonna go through some of the main reasons here. First, we're gonna talk about limited natural range. So some of this is natural, it's not all bad, but it's kind of cool. Here's a statistic for you. 45, greater than 45% of the crayfish species in our country, their ranges are so small they can be contained within the borders of one state. And here's an example, here in Missouri, down here in the St. Francis River drainage, we have two species, <coughs> excuse me, the Big Creek crayfish and the St. Francis River crayfish. Those are the two species I alluded to that just were listed federally threatened. Their entire distribution in the whole world is right in this river drainage, okay? And this is common in crayfish. Like I said, 45% of all the species in the U.S. have something like this going on. We also have physical habitat loss, dams, channelization, gravel mining. Uh, one that is a pet peeve of mine, and I know you've all seen this. This photo was actually taken in Colombia. What you can see here is some developer removed all the vegetation and in a feeble effort to control the silt, put these silt fences up, but they don't seem to have worked very well, do they? Um, <laughs> the water ran off. Water's all muddy, carrying silt, sediment, eventually ends up in these brand new sewer systems, and then ends up somewhere down the line in the Missouri River, a place that you all care about. And that's why the Missouri River is brown a lot of the time. Um, this is a simple equation. Crayfish require the spaces and crevices between larger, not smaller gravel, but larger rocks on stream lakes and bottoms for shelter. That sediment that ends up in the rivers filters out eventually, deposits out, and it clogs those spaces, it clogs those pores. And when it does, it reduces the overall amount of shelter. It, it just clogs them, it reduces the shelter. When there's less shelter, fewer organisms can occupy that area, and it, re the, it reduces the number of organisms that can live in a certain section of stream what we call the carrying capacity of the habitat. And if you go back to what I was saying earlier that we tend to think in terms of the animals and the food, it's all energy. It reduces the amount of energy in the food webs in those water bodies. So just failing to put up a good silt fence translates to that when you get out into the river. So that's a form of pollution, but there are other forms of pollution, as we all know. Um, this is a nice pipe discharging whatever the hell that is into um, the Merrimack River system around St. Louis. We've done a lot of work on lead mining, so I'm going to talk about that. And I'm going to preface it by saying lead mining and probably most forms of mining, if they're done responsibly, correctly and with some conscience, they're not going to be a problem. Um, the problem is a lot of times they're not. Uh, 
And we found that to be true with quite a bit of the lead mining that's gone on in Missouri. And we've worked all across the southern tier of the state. And I've been very fortunate in my career to work with um, one of the best scientists I've ever been around. She lives here in Columbia. Her name is Annie Allert. And her academic advisor is in the crowd, Charlie Rubini. Uh, Annie is tremendous, hard as hardworking a scientist as I've ever known in my career. She headed up these studies, and I was lucky enough that she brought myself and my crew on board. We did five or so studies on the effects of lead mining to stream ecosystems across the southern tier of Ozarks. We use crayfish as a study organism because they're handy, easy to work with, but we also looked at insects and in some cases fish. Across five studies across the southern half of Missouri, we saw the same things happening. We saw crayfish numbers greatly reduced or even absent for many miles downstream of some of these mines. Insects were also greatly reduced. Another study, we took crayfish, we built these cages we put them these cages out in the streams. We'd put like 25 in one spot, 25 in another spot, and then we'd put a series of cages in clean streams for comparison. What we found is after eight weeks, most of these crayfish were dying. Um, we sometimes let the cages go 12 to 16 weeks, kept seeing the same thing. A lot of death, but when we didn't, when they didn't die, we could still see them incapacitated. We took those dead crayfish, we sent them to labs and had them studied for metals, and we found high levels of metals in those crayfish and in some of the other organisms. The other thing we did when we put the crayfish in these cages, we put in these bundles of leaves to provide them with food, but also to watch the rate at which the leaves would be broken down by the crayfish and the insects that were crawling around. Again, we compared this to clean streams, and what we found was that the leaf breakdown in these cages, in these areas below these mines, was greatly reduced. So you go back to what I talked about earlier, if the leaves aren't being broken down out in these sections of streams, it affects the nutrient cycling, which, is, which affects the whole trophic or food web, the whole system. It all comes together like that. So you have reduced biodiversity, reduced ecosystem function, and reduced sport fish food in your streams. The last concern I want to talk about is invasive species. It can be confusing. There's a lot of terminology out there, so I'm going to go through that real quick. Non-native and alien species basically mean the same thing. These are species that have been transported, introduced outside of their known natural range, and they have the potential to become invasive. The invasive species is then that alien or non-native species that has become, that has been transplanted, become established, undergone that population expansion, often to the detriment of native systems and native species. It's a problem worldwide, folks. It's the second most important cause of ecosystem change in the world after habitat loss. It's also one of three major threats to biological diversity right behind habitat loss and climate, climate stress. A little closer to home um, in North America, invasive crayfish, uh, let's talk about that. We've documented in, on this continent greater than 25 crayfish species, let's just say 25, that have become invasive in North America. Here's the weird part of this. All 25 of those species are North American species. So I'm giving, I'm giving pause for effect here so you can all let your brains work. How the hell does that work? These are native, but they're invasive. And it goes back to what I talked about earlier, crayfish having those small geographic ranges. So I showed you some species that occur in one river drainage in Missouri. Somebody takes some of those, moves them somewhere else in the state of Missouri, they have the capability to become invasive. It's a problem. A um, few years ago, an undergraduate student that worked with me, Cheyenne Stratton, I'm, and I mention her name because 
in about a month, she's taken my job. It's really cool. She went off. She's finishing her PhD. Um, after she worked for me, she worked for Craig Parker back there at the university a little bit. She's down in Florida now, but she just this past week, she landed the job to replace me. But when she was an undergrad, she worked with me on a project where we surveyed all the fish and wildlife agencies in this country and in Canada. And what we found was half of U.S. states and Canadian provinces reported natural resource problems due specifically to invasive crayfish. So it's a big problem on our continent. Invasive crayfish cause declines in next extirpations of native species. A one paper estimated that 4% of North American crayfish were going to go extinct per decade due to these invaders. They cause declines or extirpations of amphibians, reptiles, mollusks, and fish. We know they eat eggs, fish eggs, amphibian eggs. They often alter habitat. So in our northern tier lakes, uh, I don't know if, if any of you have gone to Wisconsin or Minnesota to some of those beautiful lakes up there. And you know, you go along the shore, they have these nice plant beds. And those plant beds are just gold mine for life. Um, they're for, particularly for insects and their spawning grounds and rearing grounds for small fishes. There's a species of crayfish up there, an invasive crayfish. Many of you have probably heard of the rusty crayfish. It's wreaking havoc on these aquatic plant beds, eliminating those habitats, and then the fish have nowhere to spawn and reproduce and grow, blah, blah, blah. They also alter food webs and food chains. They've actually caused sport fishery declines and economic damage to recreationally based economies in local economies in some of our northern states. So they're bad news. What about closer to home? Well, um, my crew and I, along with some of the people from the university, over 30 years, we documented 31 crayfish invasions in Missouri. We confirmed declines of six native species, including those two threatened species I've talked about a couple times. We've determined that these invasions have probably resulted from re live releases of crayfish by anglers, pe people um, who have crayfish as fishing bait and release it at the end of the day from places where they didn't obtain it. Pet owners, school teachers, and aquaculturists. And yeah, I'm going after the school teachers. We actually surveyed every public school teacher in the state of Missouri one time to find out who kept crayfish in aquariums, et cetera, asked them what they did with the crayfish at the end of the year. You don't want to know. A lot of them ended up like in the local sewer or whatever the closest city pond was. So on to crayfish conservation in Missouri. Um, I, I started this program years ago. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. We've been running a long time, but I'm going to quickly talk about our program that I'll soon be leaving. We've got four program goals. I'm going to talk about each one of those and cite some examples of what we do. The first thing we wanted to do when we started was to increase our knowledge of crayfish ecology and management. We didn't know squat about them. Nobody really did. Um, we worked closely with, in the beginning, with um, Charlie Rabini, who's here. He was at the university then. We were partners in a lot of this research. Uh, I talked about some of it earlier. We researched Missouri's most popular sport fish to determine the importance of crayfish in their diets. And we also researched crayfish habitat requirements among many other things, life histories, et cetera. Secondly, we wanted to increase knowledge required to conserve imperiled species. So we focused on the rare species here. And over the years, we conducted about 30 different studies to determine distributions, life cycles, habitat requirements, and or genetics of 10 imperiled species. And we looked at those four things, those four attributes, because those are the things that scientists need to know, want to know, if we're bringing a species back, if we're trying to conserve a species. And that's where we put our money and time. <clears throat> Thirdly, I'm real big on public education, and it's the reason I'm here tonight. 
Um, I always made it important that the students that worked with me, they were going to help educate the public. Here's just an example. Um, many of you have probably been to Columbia's Stream Extravaganza. We would always participate in that. This is us there. We would bring a kiddie's wading pool, fill it full of rocks and crayfish, give the kids aquarium nets, and just let them go to town catching crayfish. And we'd sneak in a little education. We like to do those kinds of events. I, don't, I would also take that same setup to elementary school classrooms. And I find it funny now that one of the, I went to a first grade classroom one time in Harrisburg, Missouri, and a young girl in that first grade class is now my assistant down at the Department of Conservation. So that was really cool for me. Um, we published multiple magazine articles. We try to write those in a popular style so we can appeal to the public and educate them. And anytime I can, I'll get a news station or whatever, sticking a camera in my face or a, a microphone in my mouth. I'm going to do an interview, newspaper interviews, whatever. We just like to get the word out and educate the public. The last of our strategies is we like to develop conservation strategies. We like to take the data we produce and actually do something with it. And it's not always easy when you work in government. Um, there's a lot of roadblocks in your way, not necessarily from within your agency, but, well, you know what I'm talking about. Just a lot of people don't want you to move forward, but um, we've always tried to put our data into action and to conserve these organisms. Examples, we've recently developed program to monitor the population status of those two threatened species. And Cheyenne, who's going to take my job, she's going to spend a lot of years doing that. And hopefully, we're already trying to determine ways to conserve them. Um, there was a young Anna back there is finishing her master's degree on those species. And she's coming up with some uh, possible ways we can conserve them right now as part of her master's degree. Uh, we also have developed regulations and training program to reduce crayfish introductions of invasive species in Missouri. We put together this brochure for bait vendors and aquaculturists showing them what species they should and should not have in their bait stores or in their aquaculture ponds. And again, these are just some of the examples. All right, I've talked too long, so I don't expect you to remember much. I threw a lot at you, but if you can remember a few take-home points. First of all, remember, crayfish adds substantially to our country's and our state's biodiversity. Secondly, they're key drivers of food webs and ecological function in our water bodies. Are you ready? Crayfish eat everything. All right, they stimulate nutrient cycling, they provide habitat for other animals, and there are threats. We have to worry about silt and sedimentation, other forms of pollution, but really, I believe, and a lot of people that work in the United States on this stuff with me believe right now the biggest threat are these invasive crayfish, and they're caused by live releases. So if you've got live crayfish and you're done with them, just kill them. It may seem cruel to you, but it's not nearly as cruel as having a native species wiped out somewhere. And with that, I'll take questions. Okay, so I'm going to chase you down if you have questions and get your questions on a microphone. And I also want to mention, too, that... Um, we're going to do a raffle after Bob's done here for a kayak we've been selling tickets to for quite a while, and we will get to that. I should have done it before, but here is our first question. Hey, Bob, thanks very much. It was a great talk. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, I've noticed um, someplace like the Upper Jacks Fork, there's a tremendous amount. I think it's the Didymo that's growing along all the, the rock snot, along all the the riffles. Um, and I'm thinking now, well, that's food for a crayfish, but yeah. it, does it also get so, so big that it clogs up their habitat? Is there a relationship there you're concerned about? I, I think my main concern there would be, um, 
if it gets so thick and big, um, covering up the substrate and the and the uh, hidey holes, if you will, um, just clogging things up. And then, of course, you know, limnologically speaking, there's the whole oxygen situation. And I'm not a limnologist, but so it's it's not totally a bad thing, but too much of a anything is probably a problem. So I just wondering who you work with. Like if you go to a national convention, what kind of convention would it be? Would you be speaking? Would you be uh would they uh, yeah, to learn? Yeah. Um so for years I was going to this convention. Um used to be called the North American Benthological Society, benthological meaning bottom dwelling. That transformed into, um, help me out, David or Charlie, freshwater, uh, sci freshwater science, yeah. But uh, there's also now a group called the International Association of Astecology, which is all crayfish, and started in Europe, but we've gotten stronger and stronger in this, on this continent and that's that's my favorite meeting to go to because it's just a bunch of mud bug nerds getting together from all over the world so does that answer does that answer your question okay okay yeah so well in the states i mentioned here a lot of the states and particularly the southeast and the midwest are now hiring crayfish biologists, usually no more than one per state. Um, and a lot of people in, a lot of the crayfish scientists are in the universities here. There's not a whole lot of us in, in North America. Uh, Canada has a fair number. You go to uh, Europe and there's a lot of crayfish scientists because they have big time problems. Crayfish are a big part of the European heritage, particularly in the Nordic states. And they made the mistake years ago of bringing over some American species uh, because they grow large and they like to eat their crayfish over there in Finland and Norway and Sweden. And uh, invasive species, they're wiping out their native species. So when you have problems, that's when you hire people to work on them. They have a lot of crayfish biologists in Europe. So... Um, got a question over here. So you never answered the question about food as human food, like, oh, um, is it reasonable to eat that leading back to what you said, yeah, or like, you know, our, and then, um, <laughs> As our own, are we decimating by making no, 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 it no, eating no, or anything no. like that? Oh, yeah. So. That actually raises a good question. Question within a question. No, I'll eat crayfish anytime I can can. Um, generally, our water bodies in Missouri are very productive with regard to crayfish. Okay. Uh, if it's a healthy system, they are very prolific organisms. I think I showed you how many eggs they can, you know, um, and it, but it would be really hard to deplete a population of crayfish if it was in a healthy stream, for example. So, no, I have no problems with you eating crayfish. Uh, the only thing I would caution is make sure they're cooked well, because there is a parasite in them. And there's been a year, few years ago, there was kind of a rash of people getting this parasite because they were eating crayfish live. Um, so... They were drunk. <laughs> so maybe, maybe that's a solution to dumping your crayfish. Why? Why? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why not eat them? Sure. Eat your bait. Yep. Well, there, there's a few questions online. Um, and I, I was disappointed. You said that some of your, your friends that were watching were going to like throw some little bomblets in here. And I haven't seen anything <laughs> too behaving. bad. Somebody did call you a little long in the tooth. I will say that. Um, okay. And their question, though, really is like, 
Are there a new generation prepared to follow in your footsteps after this um, really kind of trailblazing career that you've had in crayfish biology? You've yeah, talked about so that there's a two bit. parts to that question. It, it really comes down to the administrators at my agency and what they want to do with what was my former position. They've modified it slightly. Um, it's going to be working on more than just crayfish now. For example, I think it's going to be working on also that Heinz Emerald Dragonfly, for example, hmm. just expanding it a little. But yeah, um, they've hired someone and she's going to be starting in a month or two. And she's really, really good. And so um, we're going to be continuing to do some crayfish work. Um, what? Hey, I have a question for you. Um, so I spent a lot of time as a child barefoot in creeks and I was always terrified that I was going to lose a toe to a crayfish. <laughs> and, and now I spend a lot of time taking kids to creeks. So my question is, have you been pinched by one? Oh. And I'm sure you have. How, many, well, how like? many hundreds of times? How yeah. bad does it hurt? It depends. So I've never seen data on this, but I've been pinched seriously hundreds of times. And I will tell you, that no, no crayfish pinches harder than a female carrying eggs. And that might be me just transposing my human thoughts onto this animal, but I've had it happen numerous times where she would dig in so hard, nobody could get her off my finger, and my finger turned purple. So... Wow. Um, like, you know, we would handle crayfish every day and we would handle hundreds every day. So you're bound to get pinched and you get used to it. <laughs> well, kind of following up on that too, you know, my memory as a kid was like going to someplace like the Black River and they're just being crawdads everywhere. And like, it doesn't seem like that's the case anymore. I keep um, hearing that. You, so you hear that, but in it's hard to know like what is me an adult just not paying attention in the same way or not remembering thing. I'm just curious about two things. Like, is there any data? And and it kind of sounds like maybe not to like support that. And then number two is like, I've seen otters go to town on crayfish and like when, when otters really moved in across the state, was there a population impact on crawdads too? Yeah. all well, that's, it's really complex, but things, Things never stay completely stable in nature, right? So there's flu population fluctuations going on. Um, I've had people in meetings down in southern Missouri screaming at me about the otters. Um, and there's no doubt they eat a crap load of crayfish. And we pretty much eliminated otters from this state. So many of we us humans were basing our perception of reality, we were basing it on systems without otters. Then we bring back these otters that were here before we were, and now we're screaming because the otters are eating all the crayfish. So those are the kind of questions that people in my profession face all the time. But they're still out there, and they're still out there in good numbers. Um, and I'm talking about in healthy streams, too. So we're seeing a lot of uh, – one thing – if you if you go to Missouri streams long enough, particularly if you're studying them, um, what you start to see, I, I talked about it a little bit in the program, is the stream substrate, the size of the, the rocks on the stream bottom. We like to see good-sized, chunky rocks that have good interstitial spacing. What we're starting to see in a lot of the streams is they're silting in, they're graveling in, and seeing a lot finer stuff. And you'll see even slugs of this fine gravel moving down through streams over the course of a year. All that material is introduced um, when stream banks are sloughing because oftentimes it, it can occur naturally too when a tree might fall in and all the soil around. But humans are exacerbating that by farming right up to stream edges and removing the trees that grow along streams. And all that exacerbates soil moving in and then those fine gravels, and that just can clog up these streams. 
And when you do, like I pointed out in some of these slides, you're reducing that carrying capacity of insects and crayfish and streams. And of course, since they're the food organisms, then you're reducing the carrying capacity of the fish. It all translates. So does that help? Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. For sure. I'm sure you could teach a course on that. Well, I don't know, but I could talk about it for a long time, bitch about it. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how familiar you are with the streams here in Columbia, but um, in Grindstone Park, Grindstone Stream, mm -hmm. crayfish are just thick up and down the stream through there. And I assume it's maybe because it's a real healthy, clean stream, but you know, other creeks in Columbia, Hinkson and Flat Branch, I don't really see that many crayfish in those. And I was wondering what kinds of, I assume that's because of pollution, but what kinds of pollution most negatively affect crayfish? You know, first of all, I agree with you. Whenever I need to catch crayfish to go give a presentation, <laughs> I go to Grindstone, right down in the park. Uh, yeah, they're easy there. But generally, I always hesitate to put labels on any group of animals. Crayfish, many crayfish species are pretty hardy. Um, you really have to hit them hard to knock them out. Um, but, you know, they will be victimized by various forms of pollution. And again, if they don't have places to hide, things are going to eat them, the populations are going to decrease. So in streams like that, I might be looking at the, the stream bottom to see if it's all silty or what size the rocks are. Um, so I, I don't know enough about those particular watersheds to know what's going in them from what's coming out of the homes around them or the, uh, any industry. So I know one of the ones you mentioned goes right through town. You said flat branch or flat. yeah. So it wasn't much of an answer, but that's my specialty. <laughs> Avoiding questions. <laughs> I'm a little bit curious about the historic range of some of these uh, uh, species. Uh, I can't imagine we have a lot of good historical evidence, but maybe I'm totally wrong on that. But No, you're totally right. You talk about some of them being very, very small. Are they small by virtue of the fact that they shrunk? Or is that is it so specific to the environment that they're in is why they're where they are? That's a great question. Here's the problem. We didn't start studying crayfish. I said in Missouri was the first. And we really didn't start doing it till the late 1970s. We don't have an idea what was here decades before that. We can listen to uh, citizens talk about numbers of crayfish and streams, but in terms of what species were where, there's not, there were very few scientists roaming the country looking at that. Um, we are so far behind fish or even the muscle people. The muscle people, they recognize their fauna was in trouble well before crayfish biologists started looking at crayfish. So um, the muscle people started accumulating a lot of data in the starting back in the 60s and 70s. We're so far behind everyone with crayfish. And this was something I always argued to my bosses is when they're like telling me, well, we got to move on to other things. It's like, we're just now establishing the baseline. And this is, we're past the year 2000. And we're just now laying down the baseline for a lot of our river systems. There are still river systems in Missouri that my crew and I and the university folks, we've never got to them. We don't know what's in there. So we've got a long way to go just to get that baseline information. Does that, so to get to your answer, we don't know. And because they don't have uh, bones, bony structures, people can't go back and look at, look for skeletons and study what was there, et cetera. There's some information we can get from like native peoples use crayfish, whatever, but 
we can't really find out what species they were eating or using. So it's a tough one. So Bob, there's a few more questions online too. Um, <clears throat> Jordan Lane was wondering, um, are there any crayfish species known to primarily live in big rivers like the Missouri River? Um, he also said, thank you for speaking today, Mr. Crawley Bottoms. <laughs> Did you say Jordan Lane? Jordan Lane. Yeah, he used to work on our crew. Uh, I'm sorry, for, the question was what? <laughs> Are there any um, crayfish species specifically known to live in big rivers like the Missouri River? Are there kind of specialists for that big river habitat? Yeah. yeah. So crayfish bi biologists are afraid to get in the big rivers. Well, that's not entirely true, but um, so much of our work is done when we're waiting and when we can see into the water and there's not been enough work done on our big rivers or nor our North Missouri streams. Um, there are some species that I know are common in the Missouri River. Um, they're, they're common throughout Missouri. One called the viral crayfish, which is common throughout the Midwest. And it's the one we find most commonly in Boone County down at Hinkson and these other places. They're very common in the Missouri River. Uh, we also have a species that's, people think of it as an Ozarkian species, the golden crayfish, which is a beautiful little crayfish, but you'll find it in the Missouri River. Um, and I, there's maybe two or three other species in the river, but the number of species in the Missouri River is not a high number. Until you get down to... Um, well, when where some of the feeder streams start coming in. So for example, we've got some species that occur. One species occurs in the Merrimack River, nowhere else in the world. I imagine down near its mouth. Um, oh, right. you know, those those kind of situations. But generally in the main stem Missouri, there's not a high number of species. And you know, it, it seems like it would be a different kind of habitat. They're not looking for, you yeah. know, I mean you have all this riprap on the side. That's a certain kind of habitat, but otherwise it's yeah, mud yep. and sand. And yeah. that's a little different than yep. big rocks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and we know most of the North Missouri streams were really depopulated of rocks the way we think of them, but they had native crayfish, but again, not many species in North Missouri. <clears throat> so one other question was, um, do you have any advice in terms of like, the type of education that a young person who wanted to pursue a research career like yours should be looking at? Yeah. Um, I went through, I, I, my degrees were both in fisheries science, but um, any degree in the, in biological sciences, environmental sciences for an undergraduate degree, fisheries, environmental science, um, aquatic biology. But these days, you you have to go to graduate school and, and get at least a master's degree. Uh, and then you're going to specialize and you're probably going to be in fisheries or some universities even have degrees in, again, in aquatic sciences. So, right. That master level is where you get into the more research position. Yeah, if you want to work for a state agency, generally a master's degree will do it. If you want a job where you have your own projects and, and uh, you, you can get technician level positions with just a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. But uh, now some of, some of these positions are a lot more of them are starting to go to PhDs. So. Oh. Cool. Thank you. Um, anyone else have another? This might be one of the last hey, ones. Hey, Bob. Um, so I don't, I may have missed it, but how do crayfish get into the intermittent streams? I see them in our intermittent stream in the spring, but that's not the terrestrial one, is it? That's a really cool question. Um, we've learned 
And I firmly believe that, well, let me back up and say, aquatic biologists, in my opinion, have largely neglected intermittent streams. Uh, we just don't get in them because by the time we get geared up for our summer work and we get our young people onboarded and all that, it's, you know, late spring, early summer. And a lot of those streams are starting to dry up and they've just not been studied. Um, what we call, well, you know, first order, second order streams. Over the course of my career, we actually found probably three to four species in Missouri that um, did best in those small streams. There's one species I know of. We've only found it in nine locations in the state. It's actually, it, it's, it's in Arkansas as well, but we only found it in nine locations in Missouri and probably seven of those nine locations were small first order streams that dried up part way through the summer. What we've learned, we did one project when my summer college students hated me for this. Um, we had quadrat samples that we would take in streams that were a square meter in size and, and we lay down this frame and we'd kick in it into a net. Well, we took that into dry stream beds and we dug down about 18 inches down into the gravel, took all that gravel out of a square meter plot. And we did that like 60 or 70 times throughout stream. And what we found, we have these real cool photographs. We would find crayfish down in there in the sand in rocks, just staying in place where it was the, the water table was still running underneath there. There was just no surface flow. And they're just sitting in there getting oxygen out of the water as it passes over their gills. And I don't know if or how they're eating, but it's it's ripe for exploration. You know, there, there's stuff going on in those small streams. And we've just not, as a biological community or as a community of biologists, we've just not looked hard enough at those situations. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Well, did you have another? <clears throat> Did you um what what was the best strategy for dealing with invasives? What 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 is what how do you deal with invasives? Once they're here, you can't hardly do anything. We're kind of panicking now in the situation with those two species that we've listed as federally threatened. Um and we're going into that watershed um working with Anna, who's in the back of the room, she's a grad student, and Dr. Jacob Westhoff at the university that works with Craig. We're trying to locate Anna's project. She's trying to locate possible refugia for the natives way up in the upper reaches of some of these streams. It's in the St. Francis River drainage, and I don't know if you know that drainage, but it's got a different geology than anywhere else in the state. And there are some natural um, waterfalls and shut-ins and things like that. And we're looking for possibly for places where we can maybe even install some very low three foot high small dams across some of these small streams where we know the native crayfish are existing upstream of those and try to keep the, the invasives from moving, continuing to move upstream and just try to conserve what's there for now till we figure out a longer term solution. Um, sorry, what, what was the, did that answer? Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, other than that, once they're here, they're here. And so it's just preaching to people to don't release crayfish. Don't dump your bait, whatever. Well, um, 
We have Dr. Craig Pockert here as well from the University of Missouri Fisheries, and he had something that he wanted to say as well. <laughs> yeah, just really quickly as we wrap up, you know, you've heard Bob talk about his 37 year career and you've seen the legacy that he has in crayfish ecology and management. His legacy goes much deeper than this. The amount of mentorship that he's provided mm -hmm. to high school students, to undergrads, to graduate students, to young professionals throughout his career that still like him today, that will come back to Columbia <laughs> on a regular basis to hang out for his get togethers. But I know no, no other person outside of academia that has as much influence and mentorship as, as Bob has on the young communities. And you've heard several names and several people online that are all part of this legacy. Bob, we really appreciate you taking the time to to share a lifetime's worth of uh, studying of these amazing creatures. And